10 things they don't tell you about evolution. I'm Paul, this is the Orthodox Project, let's get this started. Last video we talked a little bit about evolution, so let's recap in 30 seconds what did we talk about last time concerning evolution. Uh, apparently according to evolutionists where we all came from, a one-celled amoeba. You heard of the theory of macroevolution? From the goo to you via the zoo. Okay, this was the goo. And in Darwin's day, they didn't really know how complex a cell was. Uh, and I'd like to show you what actually is in a cell. But before we get there, notice that it doesn't say made by God or made by natural forces on it. In other words, when you observe something like an amoeba, you have to make an interpretation as to how that amoeba arrived. You have a message in DNA that is about 3.5 billion letters long. All the letters are in the right order. There is no known biological, chemical, or physical reason why the letters go in this order. We know that A always goes with T and C always goes with G, but this order right here is your unique software, if you will. Why are the letters in that order? In fact, Bill Gates, who is the uh, CEO or former CEO of Microsoft, put it this way. He's not a Christian. He said, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. Well, actually, even if it did start in an amoeba, it's a very short message. To get a much longer message where all the letters are in order, you still couldn't evolve it, evolve it by random means, right? I mean, let's just grant say a program like Microsoft PowerPoint, which is the program I'm using right now. If you just granted us that program and you began to modify the code randomly, what would happen to the program? Would it get better or worse? Right, it's gonna shut down. It's gonna, it's gonna crash. Because you can't modify something randomly and get anything but gibberish. All right, but in the, in, back in the day, these big thick books that you'd buy, would have the information that you'd need to know to be an informed citizen. Well, imagine a thousand of those crammed into an amoeba, microscopic, microscopically small. All the letters are in the right order. Where did that come from? And then I told them what they believe, because most of them don't know what they believe. You got to tell them. <laughs> you guys believe 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. One professor was getting kind of upset about that time. He said, Hoban, do you realize there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world? I said, yes, sir, there's a bunch. He said, do you mean to tell me that all those dogs came from only two dogs on Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> he didn't have any more questions after that. I was in a debate one time, and afterwards this lady came up to me and she said, she was obviously upset. She said, tonight, you said that we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, ma'am, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, okay, then tell me, where did we come from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, and where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. <laughs> it was so cool. You could see it was slowly dawning on her. You know, I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? If take out the garbage mom requires an intelligence, it would seem to me that a thousand volumes of an encyclopedia worth of a message requires intelligence as well. The first life requires an intelligent cause. I could take this template and apply it to other things. Here's a bougainvillea tree in front of my house, right? In that tree, I often find what? Nests. Do I think this just happened because the wind blew it together? Does it grow in the tree that way? Or is it the product of intelligent design? Birds who are intelligent. Look at how, this is actually very, very beautiful. It's got the, the thicker things on the outside. It's nice and soft, fine on the inside. You can almost tell what it's for just based on its design. And it resembles other designed objects like bowls we already know. He wrote a book called Darwin's Black, Black Box. What he discovered, in bacterial, uh, bacterial uh, organisms is a little motor that drives the bacteria. The motor is called a flagellum. And it looks like this. 
In the wall of the bacteria is a motor made of 40 proteins assembled in a very specific formula, very specific pattern, which builds out this whipping tail that can stop on a dime, turn directions, and bend any way it wants. And this whipping tail is what drives bacteria. The question is, how in the world does that 40-piece protein machine ever get like that? This is a motor, a rotary motor, we didn't even discover until 1978. By that time, we were making rotary engines for years. It looks just like our rotary motors. Yet we're gonna ask the question, can I get this through by staying inside the room? Through some natural process of law? Or do I have to go outside the room to get this? That's the problem. So how do I explain that motor naturally by staying in the room? Some have suggested, well, maybe it evolved from a slightly less complicated thing called a type three secretion system. That type three secretion system does look a lot like the motor, doesn't it? It is dramatically different in function. It may look like the motor, but it has nothing similar to what it actually does, that the motor does. Here's the other problem. This is a 30 piece designed object. It has all the attributes of design we see in this one. The question I have is how did this one come about? If you think we got from zero proteins to 30 to get this, can you please show me the pathway from zero to 30? Because remember in biology, if evolution is true, you gotta have a one protein thingamajiggy that helps the organism that survives and passes on till then it comes a two protein thingamajiggy, then a three protein thingamajiggy. You gotta show me a pathway, a functional pathway from zero proteins to 30 to get this. Then you gotta show me from 30 to 40 to get this. Guess what? No one can find that. And there's no remnant in the biological systems of anything along the way. And now evolutionary biologists are more inclined to say, you know what? I can't get this from this, but this may have de-evolved into this because they know how hard it is to go in the other direction. It's much easier to get broken Lego pieces than to shake the Lego machine, the Lego box, and get all the pieces to come together. It's easier to break them apart. So if you're gonna stay in the room by offering some form of evolution, good luck with that. In 1912, discovery in Piltdown, New England, news, news. The British Museum, led by Charles Dawson, reconstructed fragments of a skull and jawbone and hailed it as link between ape and man. Hallelujah. God is proven wrong. There is no God. Oh, shoot. About 11 years later, it was revealed as a hoax, as a combination of a human skull, orangutan jaw, teeth. But, scientific, but the scientific community did not concede it until 1953. Why would the scientific community not admit facts that this is a hoax till 30 years after the fact? Why? Why? 30 years! It was revealed as a hoax. And then they waited 30 years till they admitted that this is all not true. What? They don't want to believe. They don't want to believe. Are people seeing what they want to see? Unfortunately, unfortunately, people are on a happiness quest, not a truth quest. People don't want there to be a God. Therefore, they're going to try to find any excuse to believe that there's no God. Even if they're the ones making up the lie, they're, they're creating the lie and believing it. There's two central arguments for evolution. The first one, small adaptations lead to new species. Okay, this is when people start saying, hey, when we see microevolution in the world, that makes good evidence for macroevolution. The other argument for evolution is similarities in structure, homology, and DNA are evidence of common ancestors. Okay, so we some people are saying similar structure proves evolution. Some people are saying small adaptations that we see today prove macroevolution. When we look at evolution, does it really occur? When we look today, we see microevolution. We never see macroevolution. No one actually throughout history was able to see macroevolution ever. And no one will ever be able to because with information, there's genetic limits. There has never have been a, a, some species that crossed over to another species proven by science. It's just not there. There's nothing called a rabbit all of a sudden became a lion that has never been seen, never been observed, never been tested. Again, 
Anything else is theories because again, that's not science. If, if something is not repeatable, testable, observable, it's not science. It's just theories, it's hypotheses. That's the case with micro and macro evolution. Micro evolution, a dog becomes different types of dogs. That's fine, that's micro evolution. Very nice, very useful, very true. Adaptation, nothing is wrong with that. But when we start talking about macro evolution, that never existed and never will. And we'll never find evidence for that. And no matter how many skulls you bring me, again, similar skulls doesn't prove that they all came from each other. Maybe similar design proves that there's a, a same designer, not just common ancestors. Change attributed to natural selection is cyclical, not directional. What does that mean? When we look, for example, at beak depth in dry years, and we see that beak depth in dry years is more than non-dry years, if, as you see here in this chart. Of course, this proves, right, these finches, right, prove what? that microevolution does happen, right? Adaptation happens. Animals and humans and life, right? We adapt to our environment in order to survive, the survival of the fittest, if you want to say. But if you look at this Darwinist's theories, you start with finches and end with finches. But the origin of finches is never explained, right? The change is cyclical, not directional. We don't have a rabbit and it becomes a bird. We don't have a lion and it becomes a dinosaur. All of a sudden, we have a bird and it stays a bird. It's just the finches are different. It's just the wings are different. It's just the colors are different. It's just the beaks are different. We start with finches and end with finches. But where did the finches come from? That's never explained, right? Microevolution, the thing we see in today in, in the natural world is based on survival, not arrival, right? Microevolution is based on survival, right? Animals or human species or any living species are trying to survive, therefore they adapt. But evolution, there's no proof for macroevolution of how we arrived to a peak in the first place. Some people say similarities in structure, homology, and DNA are evidence for common ancestor. Let's look at that. Richard Dawkins said, The reason we know for certain that we are all related, including bacteria, is the universality of the genetic code and other biochemical fundamentals. So he's saying, just because the genetic code is similar, that means we all came from the same species. Really? If you have phones that are very similar in design, that could mean that they have the same designer. It doesn't have to be that one phone gave birth to another phone or evolved from another phone. If you see different phones with a similar design, they could have a common designer. Just like that theory is possible, another very logical theory is that the same designer that designed the first phone, designed the second phone, designed the third phone. It just, that's common sense. Unfortunately, science jumps to the conclusion that, hey, if the phone there's 50 phones and they all have the same design. According to this logic, hey, they must have a common ancestor. Why can't it be a similar design? Because it's the same designer. It sounds like common sense, but unfortunately in the world today, we're not really looking for common sense. We're trying to just, we're trying to calm our conscience. We don't want there to be a God. Because if there's a God, that means there's gonna be a judgment day. And, there, and if there is a judgment day, we're gonna to have to give an account on everything we do. And that means we have to be accountable. People don't want to be accountable. Let's continue with Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins said, the reason we know for certain we are all related, including bacteria, is the universality of the genetic code and other biochemical fundamentals. My philosophical commitment to materialism and reductionism is true, but I would prefer to characterize it as a philosophical commitment to real explanation. What did Richard Dawkins just admit to? He just admitted to his own bias. Richard Dawkins is saying, hey, before I even look at the evidence, I am already saying that I have a philosophical commitment to materialism and reductionism. He's admitting to his own bias and we're still believing what he's saying. He's saying before I even look at the evidence, my philosophical commitment is to this. Right? No. no, 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 he's not looking at evidence. 
with just neutrality and trying to discover where did, does this evidence lead, he's looking at this evidence trying to explain his own moral beliefs. He's ruling out intelligence beforehand. Where did DNA come from? That's a question we should all ask. Does similarity of structure prove that pot evolved from the teaspoon? Can it be that the teaspoon is very similar to the pot in design because the pot and the teaspoon are made by the common designer? By the same designer. The same blueprints. Which is more logical, a designer or that they are common ancestors? The macroevolutionary theory would like us to think that this is the picture. We all developed from a, an amoeba, a unicellular organism, and then we developed from fish to lions and monkeys and humans and birds and all that good stuff. But then when you look at the true picture, there's no links at all. There aren't just missing links. There's a missing chain. 99% of biology of any organism resides in its soft anatomy, which is inaccessible in a fossil. To take a line of fossils and claim that they represent a lineage is not a scientific hypothesis that can be tested, but an assertion that carries the same validity as a bedtime story. Amusing, perhaps even instructive, but not scientific. Again, the fossil records do not support Darwinism. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary tree that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nods of the branches, the rest is inference. However reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Okay, What does that mean? It means that as Natural Geographic is saying in this next slide, illuminating Maspati, the fossil record is like a film of evolution from which 999 of every 1,000 frames have been lost on the cutting room floor. If you want to know about the huge differences between the human bones and the bones of something like an ape, you should read into books like Darwin's Doubt or Darwin's Black Box because again, they show you that again there's huge differences huge differences in the bone structures but unfortunately we don't talk about this we just look at it huh it looks similar therefore it's the same and scientists who know that there's 999 frames missing out of 1000 they're being dishonest they're not telling us the full truth i really recommend the books you see on the screen right now just because we have a picture of two things that look similar it doesn't mean they came from a common ancestor not at all there's so many more differences between them than there are similarities. Look at the books in the description, look in the books on the screen to find out more. Some background about the theory of the naturalistic evolution. There are at least three types of evolution. All three types have to be true in order for the evolutionary process to work. They don't tell you about this because again, all three types, or as we'll see here, four types, all of them don't really have any proof, and actually we have proofs against all of them. But again, if we break this down into many types of evolution, and we realize that they all have to be true in order for the evolutionary theory to be true, actually we kind of break down evolution and we actually see that it really doesn't work. Let's get started. One, the cosmological evolution, the cosmic evolution. What does that mean? It's, it's evolution from the singularity of the Big Bang. All space, matter, and energy gradually formed the universe and all the galaxies, stars, planet, in it, right? So after the Big Bang, everything exploded, right? And then all of a sudden, oh, space, matter, and time, and energy gradually formed the universe, and, and the stars started forming, the planets started forming, the galaxies started forming, all that good stuff. Cosmological evolution needs to be true in order for the evolutionary theory to be true. Two, the geological evolution. Geological evolution is how the earth formed from the debris or the rubbish, right? Spinning around around our sun as it gathered into a ball, right? That's what the evolutionists say, right? There was a bunch of rubbish, right? A bunch of debris spinning around our sun and then they gathered into balls and made planets. Over time, the earth cooled it was not cool and cooled down. The atmosphere informed and the seas accumulated. 
without the geological evolution, the evolutionary theory wouldn't work. So we need the cosmological evolution to be true, the formation of planets and stars and galaxies, and then also the geological evolution, which means all the, 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 the cooling down of the Earth, the atmosphere forming, the seas accumulated. You get the idea. Three, biological evolution. The first life formed as chemicals spontaneously formed every compound needed for life. From this first organism, all life on Earth has gradually developed into the variety we see today. Eukaryotes, prokaryotes, you hear about all that good stuff. Chemical evolution is also kind of involved with this biological evolution because chemical evolution is specifically when non-living matter supposedly gave rise to life. So all of a sudden, a rock came alive. A soup became something that's alive right all of a sudden we started having living things so that that switch from non-living to living is called chemical evolution so the cosmological or the cosmic evolution needs to be true the geological evolution needs to be true the biological evolution needs to be true and the chemical evolution needs to be true and if one of them is not true the evolutionary process is absolutely destroyed why because you need all of them to work. Again, if you don't have planets, we don't exist. If you don't have non-living becoming living, we are not alive. If you don't have the earth cooling down, the atmosphere that we are in being formed, perfectly designed as we discussed in the last video, we're not here. So again, if any of these components don't exist, we're not here. We all remember the scientific method from seventh grade. It's pretty easy. Something has to be observable, testable, repeatable, and then we can do an experiment on it. If it's not observable or repeatable or testable, it is not science. It's just my thoughts. With that said, 10 simple problems with evolution. Simple, actually not very simple at all. They're huge problems with the theory of evolution, but things they will never tell you about. 10 things they will never tell you about. Let's start. Number one, no one has been able to observe or repeat the making of life from non-being matter giving rise to life or chemical evolution no one has ever seen it no one has ever been able to replicate it in the lab period two no one has been able to observe or repeat the changing of a single celled life from like an amoeba into a cow or a goat over billions of years no one has been able to do that no one has seen it no one has been able to replicate it that's biological evolution so now i get it number one actually shows that again we don't have any evidence for chemical evolution and then as number two we don't really have evidence for biological evolution three no one has been able to observe or repeat the big bang this astronomical evolution was never observed people tried to repeat that in the lab but then they would have to use the laws of nature in order to replicate the big bang again the big bang was nothing into something therefore the laws of nature didn't exist before the big bang therefore when you're trying to replicate that in a lab you can't use the laws of nature to to create your scientific experiment you have to not use anything no laws no nothing you have to lose nothing and then it becomes something again number three is no one has been able to observe or repeat the big bang which is the astronomical evolution so the first three things they don't tell you about is there is no evidence for chemical evolution there's no evidence for biological evolution there's no evidence for astronomical evolution hmm makes you wonder four no one has observed millions of years of life progressing in geological layers no one has seen geological evolution five the new Bueller hypothesis is one of the most ridiculous things you'll ever hear in your life. Why? Let's read together. What is the new Bueller hypothesis? Just off Wikipedia. The new Bueller hypothesis is the most likely accepted model in the field of cosmology to explain the formation and evolution of the solar system. If you skip forward a little bit, according to new Bueller hypothesis, stars form in massive and dense clouds of molecular hydrogen, giant molecular clouds. These clouds are gravitationally unstable and matter coalesces within them to smaller dense clumps which then rotate, collapse, and form stars. That's the new Beeler hypothesis. Okay, what's wrong with that? Hmm. Have you ever thought about how when we talk about the theory of evolution, actually we're really just 
turning a blind eye to every scientific discovery we've ever made? How so, Paul? The new Peeler hypothesis is not something that has been observed, nor have the smaller theoretical ideas that make up the model been observed either. For example, so this new Beeler hypothesis says that the, the gases are unstable and through some kind of process with them colliding, they collapse and they become stars. Gas clouds today, the ones we see around, gas clouds do not naturally collapse on themselves. As density of the gas increases, it naturally wants to expand, not contract into a star. When have we ever seen gases trying to contract and become a solid? That doesn't happen when there's when gas is pressured what's the automatic response it tries to go out it, it explodes out again that, that's just isn't that basic knowledge i'm pretty sure a second grader playing squeeze the bottle so you can play with the cap knows this when gas is compressed it wants to expand out it doesn't want to collapse into a solid what but that's what scientists or people that are claiming to follow science are basing their entire lives on a hypothesis like the new Beeler hypothesis, which again is claiming that again, they're they're saying that the planets formed in a way that again the way they're describing gas is actually the opposite from how we see gas today. Naturally, gas does not go into a solid. Gas expands. If the new Beeler hypothesis is wrong, or the chemical evolution is wrong, or the biological evolution is wrong, or the astronomical evolution is wrong, or the geological evolution is wrong. Let's assume all of them are correct except one. The evolutionary theory drops. It's not true. It can't happen. We're not here on Earth anymore. But guess what? None of them make sense. None of them have evidence. And everybody's talking about them and teaching them in every school out there. Really? Six the biggest hurdle of chemical evolution. Again, DNA of one human cell equals about 5 million pages of information. 5 million pages of information. The biggest hurdle of chemical evolution is the origin of information. The code found in the DNA is very complex. There is no known natural mechanism that can create such a code from natural interactions of chemical substances. It has never been seen, never been observed, never been done in a lab where again all of a sudden there's a natural process in the planet we live on or in the galaxy we live on there is nothing we see today no science no information no nothing that we see today that can show us that hey just chemicals interacting with each other can produce life that never happens ever actually some of the atheists and some of the scientists start saying we're going to separate the chemical and biological evolution because they know how problematic the chemical evolution is. They know how unscientific is the chemical evolution, how there literally is no proof. There's actually proof against the idea of chemical evolution. So they actually just try to, dis they try to dismiss all of that. They don't even teach you about it in schools. Why? Because it's one of the biggest problems with this theory. There is nothing, zero evidence that shows us that non-living can through a natural process become living. Doesn't happen, ever, and it never will. Let me ask you another question. How would biological evolution get started if chemical evolution didn't happen? If the formation of DNA doesn't happen, how would the cell be formed without the DNA? If the cell is not formed, how would the biological evolution happen? How would the other cells be made? If there's no one cell made, there can't be multiple cells. So actually, if the chemical evolution is wrong, Biological evolution is also wrong. It didn't happen. Never happened. Why are we never taught about this in schools? People are not looking for truth anymore. They're looking for what eases the conscious. They're looking for what makes them comfortable. Unfortunately. Seven. The chicken and egg problems with the theory of evolution. What does that mean? Let's take an example. DNA needs to be transcribed into RNA and then from that to make proteins. Cool, so DNA needs to be transcribed into RNA to make proteins. Easy? Okay, proteins are needed to duplicate DNA. Okay, so which come, came first? Chicken and egg problem. So the protein come first or DNA? In order for DNA to duplicate, you need protein. 
in order to make protein, you need DNA to trans be transcribed to RNA to make protein. Actually, it doesn't stop here. But DNA provides the code to make the protein. Okay, so maybe we start with DNA. But proteins spontaneously fall apart in water, but water was first needed for the whole first life to form. So if there's no water in this whole equation, no life forms. But then if all of a sudden water is here in this equation, in this process, protein spontaneously fall apart. Is your head spinning? Mine is. Which came first, DNA or RNA or protein? We'll never have the answer. Why? Because maybe nothing came first. In order for the evolutionary process to be true, one of them must have come first. One of them was there and then all of a sudden evolution happened so the other one started becoming a thing and then the third one became a thing but if all of them are dependent on each other which one came first chicken and egg problems hey maybe they were all created at the same time maybe they were all sustained held in place by a creator who designed it perfectly so we can have life without dna without rna without proteins we're not alive and they're all dependent on each other charles darwin said what if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight changes, my theory would absolutely break down. That's Charles Darwin speaking. Again, I would ask one of the most famous people in history, hey, which came first, DNA or RNA or proteins? No one will be able to answer. Because again, proteins break down in water, but the whole thing needs water to be formed. But all of a sudden, DNA needs to be transcribed into RNA to make proteins. But then proteins are needed to duplicate the DNA. <laughs> My head spins every time, but that's the beauty of our creator. Created a system that is not very tough to understand. But oh my god about the details. Oh my god about how everything fits together. How everything works together for the glory of God. 8. Before you tell me how humans and gorillas evolved from ape-like creatures, you have to be able to explain how a trait like sexual reproduction came to exist. I'm not going to really dwell on this too much, but just think about it. Evolution is claiming that something over numerous successive slight changes, something comes to existence with something like sexual reproduction it's either there or not there there is no numerous successive slight changes here it can't be possible another thought about that one how about explain how it happened the first time without going extinct aka a male and a female would have to accidentally evolve at the same time simultaneously i mean if you believe in that i'm pretty sure you have more faith than me nine before you tell me how humans and gorillas evolved from ape-like creatures, first you have to prove how fossilized crabs from millions of years ago, according to you, look identical to crabs walking the beach today. Why did no evolution happen then? Why did no evolution happen in crabs? Why did no evolution happen in so many other animals? Hmm. Just something to think about. Finally, 10. Before you tell me about evolution, tell me about the assumptions you're making. In order for the evolutionary process to be true, you have to assume that the dates calculated from the radiometric isotopes are not impacted by the assumptions involved in the calculations. I'm not going to get into this too much. But if you studied, you know what I'm talking about. There's so many assumptions in those equations, you have no idea. So many assumptions. The dates calculated from the radiometric isotopes are not impacted by assumptions involved in the calculations. Prove that to me. If they're not impacted by it, I believe you, but prove that to me first. The second thing is, you also have to assume that chemicals can assemble themselves into complex integrated systems, despite the fact that it is not happening today. Chemicals don't assemble themselves into very integrated complex systems today that doesn't happen it really does just look it up study it. it doesn't happen why if it's not happening today why are we assuming it happened so long ago why 
And then we say, oh, you, your faith is based on just following people blindly. No, people that are following evolution are the ones that are following blindly. Period. And we're not judging here. We're just saying, hey, let's wake up. If something is not observable, not repeatable, not testable, it is not science. What is considered science by definition continues to evolve and change and morph with the imagination of scientists. This is Dr. Jennifer Hall Rivera. This is a forensic doctor and scientist. Scientists are twisting truth just so they can calm their conscience and say there is no God. This theory of evolution is so flawed, I, I think it's embarrassing. It is embarrassing. We consider this the most logical theory that most people believe in. How is this logical in any way? May God open the eyes and help us all. When somebody asks you, do you believe in evolution? You should ask them three things. One, what do you mean by evolution? Because again, as we discussed, there are many types. The second question you should ask, how did you come to that conclusion? Figure out, did this person actually investigate or are they just repeating things they heard? Three, have you ever considered? Ask them, guide them. You read, you do your homework, so one day, maybe God, through you, can open somebody's eyes. If scientists, um, scholars and whatnot, if they're so smart and they really want the truth, why are they so married to evolution when there are so many you know, strong arguments um, that go against it? Well, I, I, there's probably a number of reasons that people believe in macroevolution. They've been taught it. They, it's, it's the best um, explanation from a naturalistic perspective we have, even though it's got a lot of holes in it. Um, and also, it's based on a worldview that miracles don't occur. It, they're presupposing that God doesn't exist. And they, they have to operate that way when they go into the laboratory, they think. They have to have this, what's called methodological naturalism. That they have, their method, when they do science, presupposes that there's no intelligence out there. Okay? And so when they're looking for a cause, they're always going to assume it's a natural cause, even if the evidence points to an intelligent being. So it's more of a philosophical presupposition than it is based on interpreting the evidence properly. Science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. You see, all data needs to be gathered, all data needs to be interpreted, and that's what scientists do, not science. And that's why when you hear somebody on TV saying, science says we have, no, science doesn't say a word. This is the Orthodox Project. See you next time.